Okay. So my first question, I guess, is um, what is the Hebrew roots or Christian roots movement? Um, I would say the Hebrew roots movement is more about just returning back to what the Bible says. There's so many things that we don't realize are in the Bible that once we open them up and we look at things from just a different perspective than what we were taught uh, by mainstream you know, church doctrine, so many other things come alive to us. And so when we go back to the New Testament and we realize that the disciples kept the feast, that our Messiah kept the feast, that Jesus kept the feast, you know, that's something that never dawned on us before because we've grown up our whole lives keeping other, doing other things, keeping Christmas or Easter or whatever. But actually what we see in the New Testament are amazing examples of them keeping these feasts. And if they did that, and all of these things that are really outlined in the Old Testament really point to our Messiah, it really begs the question, now why don't we do it? And so the Hebrew root thing is just doing it, right? Right, yeah, so we're going back, we're seeing that they're doing these things inside of the New Testament, and now we're going back and reading about them in the Old Testament, learning how these things work, you know, what, what are the instructions that he, he tells his children to keep? And it's like, you know, with any household, any parent tell, gives instructions to their children, and, and the children are either obedient or disobedient. And so we, being wanting to be obedient to our Father, go back and see these instructions and see these, these commandments and say, okay, I want to be obedient. How do I be obedient? Well, you just simply read the instructions, read the commandments. So, why, why are you living this way? <laughs> uh, the way what separates this from the way you're living before? So like the way of like a homestead way or just like a... No, no. <clears throat> well, it's, it's about... <clears throat> I guess the reason I live this way is because it's a desire to be obedient. I, wa I want to be obedient to my father. And really that's all that matters. What else matters in life besides hearing those words well, on that day, well done, good and faithful servant. That's all that matters to me in my life. I don't care about anything and I'll, I'll get rid of any possession. Nothing else in this world matters to me. Even my family, you know, I, I, wanted, I want this so bad to be close with my father. And uh, I'm very grateful that my wife feels the same way. But for me, it's, it's, I want to hear those words. I want my Messiah to look me in the eye one day and say, well done, good and faithful servant. Well, really, the only way I can see that happening is if we are obedient. We have this true faith, you know, that He extends to, we have, but He, he extends grace and mercy to us. But at the same time, of His children, He, he, he wants obedience. If we really believe that we are saved, if we really believe that He gave His Son for us, then it should affect how we live. We're not allowed to live any way we want. So if, if, I, can, if, I, if I can't live any way I want, and, it, and this is going to affect, this life-changing principle is going to affect how I live, I better make some changes. And those changes are really detailed in the beginning of the book. You know, how, the instructions He gives His children on how to live. And so that's, that's why I live different. When did you realize this in your life, and <laughs> what was it like? I realized this in my life back when uh, me and my wife were invited to a conference, uh, kind of unlike this, just like this one, and um, we heard some amazing speakers just give us that different perspective that we were talking about, that, uh, that just a looking at it through a different lens, uh, an Eastern, Hebraic lens, you know, and so it was really that. Me and my wife came home, we were totally blown away. I'm like, oh my gosh, you know, is this real? Is this for real? Is this really, you know, what the, what the Bible teaches? Because there's something me and my wife who had been lived our entire lives in church had never heard ever before. Never heard this perspective. This, this is so different for us. If, if we see anything wrong with this, we're out of here. And so I began this four month long journey of really studying, just spending all of my time and efforts in just getting into the Bible, getting into scripture, and, and seeing if it was true. About halfway through, I decided it is true. Now, not only do I believe I should keep these commandments and understand and, and go down this path of this understanding, I, I need to develop an argument. I need to develop uh, an apologetics to defend what I believe because Peter tells us, be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks us the reason of the hope that's in us. Well, if we're going to have an answer, we better study. We better have, a, have an answer when people come to you and say, why do you keep the feast? Well, you know, if I turn to the Old Testament, people are going to tell you automatically, well, that's the Old Testament. But if I turn to the New Testament and I show Paul keeping the feast and I show the disciples keeping the feast and I show our Messiah keeping the feast, that's a whole different perspective that people don't see normally. And so 
it's to be able to answer that question with meekness and fear and giving the answers that people really need to they desire to understand what it is you're doing so and 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 what did, what did the pastor say? What did your friends say? Well, and what are they saying now? Well, I guess my family thinks of me as some sort of cult leader or um, just a bad influence on believers because there's so many people out there now who are interested in Torah and they watch my channel and they watch my videos. And so when we first figured this all out, we had heard enough stories, horror stories from people who had discovered Torah and left the church and realized that it doesn't end well when you go into your pastor's office and say, hey, I figured out the feast, you gotta check this out. Or I figured out Shabbat, you gotta check this out. Or I figured out, the, you know, we shouldn't be eating pork. Isn't this great news? It doesn't end well for you, okay? So um, the, the problem is you don't do that. You don't go into your church and try to change the church. I believe the scales are removed off of people that the Father wants to remove the scales from. Um, but so many people around us don't understand what this is all about. And so me and my wife, when we figured this out, we said, you know what, we're just gonna leave. We're just going to leave quietly. We're going to, we had duties at the church. We were entrusted with some educational duties uh, for the adult ministries at, the, at our church. And we decided that, you know what, we're just going to go ahead and leave. And, um, and leave quietly and not try to make a fuss. Because we had heard all the drama that, that ensues when you try to do the opposite. Mm -hmm. And it, it was better. But you know what? People have come to a sense and asked why we left. And they, they think we're kind of weird. But there was a lot of people who have thought twice. You know, we didn't really burn any bridges on the way out, if you know what I mean. Yeah. And so, because we didn't burn any bridges, people have come to us and said, okay, well, you know, what is it, uh, you know, you, you believe? And, and they started to investigate. And, and they started to, you know, search on their own. That's a whole much more powerful testimony than by going and trying to shake people awake. You know, we're not really, we don't, the Father doesn't need us to all become Bible beaters and Torah terrorists about what we've learned. We just need to begin to live it, and that will be witness unto itself. Oh, describe yourself before you were part of the Hebrew Roots Movement. What were you like? <laughs> what was your life like? Okay, so before Hebrew Roots Movement, I was uh, very inv involved in the Southern Baptist Church. I attended and taught at uh, the largest Southern Baptist Church in the state of Missouri. And I was a Sunday school teacher who basically was on call. I would be requested uh, into the education department. A class would request me to come in and teach a number of topics. Usually it was about creation versus evolution. And it would be a 10 week course. And that's basically what I taught on was Genesis and creation versus evolution and what the scriptures has to, has to say about the topic. And so uh, it was a very, it's a very hotly debated topic even today. People are debating all the time about creation, you know, how old is the earth, things like that. And so I was, uh, I was very much enjoying teaching about that topic. And I, I worked as a software developer in my personal life and um, made a good, very good living. And uh, you know, didn't, you know, I had enough God in my life at the time, I think. But it was really a, a teaching by Francis Chan called Crazy Love that woke us up to, you know, are we going to really, are we really living to desire those words on that day, well done, good and faithful servant? that woke me up to, you know what, I just need to have a crazy love for my Creator no matter what gets lost, you know, in the long run. Who cares? It's all about Him. And what do I want to do for Him? Wow. And you took that to heart. All right, so now you learned this at the conference and then probably way more over the months that you studied. Mm -hmm. What's your life like now? How has it changed? And <laughs> I, I kind of want to eventually show anyone who's watching this who hasn't seen it before, you know, uh, what are they missing out on? <laughs> I, I believe you're missing out on blessings. And, you know, by learning all these things and partaking in some of these things, the, the, the feast and the Shabbat, you know, it's a blessing to have all these. And people see it as a burden. It's not a burden. You know, First uh, John 5, 3, the commandments are not grievous. They're not burdensome. And so if they're not burdensome, then they're a blessing. And he says they're a blessing over and over again. He says these are a blessing. I, I, set, you before, I set before you today a blessing and a curse. And so uh, the blessing, if you keep the commandments, a curse if you don't. So what is it we're doing as, as, as people? If, if we're just going the, through the doctrines that Christianity and religion tells us we have to keep, as many as those are, you know, which one's right? And some people who say they're all right um, versus what the Torah says there is no way. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And the Torah is called the way, the truth, and the life. You're missing out on a lot of blessings. And so, yeah, I mean, what are you missing out on? Blessings. You know.
and this is a side thing, we'll probably cut this out, but I'm guessing you enjoy your life more now. You've yeah. made drastic changes. Yeah, I mean, yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, I, I really do enjoy my life. I, I we we live out in the middle of nowhere, and uh, I I looked around I looked around at all the sin and stuff that's going on in the world today, and I'm like, man, I just I gotta get my family out of here. I can't do this anymore. I I, I gotta get, I gotta get my I, I can't protect my family enough in the midst of all this sin. You know, it's gonna rub off eventually. It's gonna it's rubbing off on me, so it affects me. And what what can I do to my kids? So I, I want to get out. I want to get out, and um, yeah, th that entailed drastic changes in my life and uh, drastic lifestyle changes. And now what I do is I basically teach others about homesteading, and I teach others about Torah. And really, it's all about Torah. It's all about God's commandments and being obedient to our Father as children. And the, the homesteading stuff brings people in uh, who may not have otherwise found new to Torah. I'm using it as a platform, and it's working. People are finding new Torah based on an AmericanHomestead.com, and so that's that's my goal. And and not everyone's going to see it. Not everyone who who comes to American Homestead and then finds new Torah is going to be interested. Oh, they're going to be like, that's weird. But this is cool. Well, great. But there's going to be a lot of people who see American Homestead and go to new Torah and go, this is really interesting. Wow, you know what? I've I've always thought about that too. Why three days and three nights when really it's Friday to Sunday? That doesn't make sense, you know. So they 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 understand some of the questions that I ask on my website. And for those who have the eyes to see and ears to hear, those people, I can reach, and that's all the Father asks us to do. Yeah, and you've gotten many questions, I'm sure, from <laughs> yeah. all, everyone. I, I get so many emails today, I can't answer them all, and I really apologize to all the people who come to my channel. I say that over and over again in my videos. I can't respond to everybody. I'm completely flattered people would email me and ask questions. Um, I'm just, I'm, all, I'm just one guy, so. <laughs> things to build. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't have a ministry. I, I, don't, I don't even take donations on my website. I'm not in this, in this for the money. I don't care about any of that. All I care about is proclaiming what I know is truth and letting the, king, the, the Father's kingdom go forth. And so I don't care about money. The Father's going to provide for me either way. I don't care. You know. Otherwise, I'll stop doing it. I mean, if I just you know, eventually starve to death, fall over and die, well then, pff. But he's not going to allow that to happen. Yeah. So he'll keep providing the substance I need, sustenance I need, and I'll keep going and spreading the gospel. And I'm not, I don't need to take money from anybody or big donations uh, to keep that going. Now that you're on this side of the line, or whatever you call it, um, <laughs> Looking back, are there any questions now that you can answer that you weren't able to answer before? Well, yeah. And in fact, uh, case in point was there was, I won't mention the name, but there was a prominent apologist from Christianity. Um, and his daughter uh, was, he was training his daughter in apologetics. And his daughter realized one day, wh why is there a God in the Old Testament who says this and a God of the New Testament who says that? And if God is unchanging through space and time and is, can, is, is he's continual? Why do we have a difference in change? He says, and what, but her conclusion was there's no God, because it's all made up. Because you can't have a God that says one thing in, in one side of the book and a guy who says another thing on the other side of the book, and have that be somehow make have it somehow make sense. It doesn't make sense. Well, instead of going back and re and, and understanding that man's doctrine is making him say two different things and not God. God never says two different things. Man's doctrine does that. So instead of investigating that type of uh, having that look at about it she just decided well god doesn't really exist at all i'm going to be an atheist well thank goodness i don't have to worry about this anymore and she lives an atheistic lifestyle now and she's the daughter of a prominent christian apologist instead i reached the same conclusion many people are reaching the same conclusion instead they're going back through the old testament and realizing that the old testament matches up perfectly with the new testament he didn't change it's only man's doctrine that made him change but if you take away man's doctrine it's all just one book that has the same message. Repent. Come back to the Torah, for the kingdom is at hand. Because I just want it to be the personal thing, really, mostly. Yeah. So what, what changed about your life? I guess we kind of talked about that a little bit. Um, my work schedule. You know, putting, placing in the importance of the commandments over other things that are in the world, distractions in the, in the world. And so that all took prominent center stage in my life. You know, what does God command on the feast? What does God command on the Shabbat? What does God command? I want to make those top priority. And uh, for those who would say it's bondage, I would say that, you know, what's going to happen? What's the very worst that could happen? I could stand before my Creator one day, and He could say, you know what, you went a little over and beyond. You really didn't have to do all that. Good job, but, you know, you were a little too legalistic. 
there's no punishment for being a little too legalistic or a little too em, you know emphatic or enthusiastic about keeping you know the commands of the Father or being enthusiastic for you know for our Creator. There's no punishment for that. So at the very least, you know, looking at it from a just completely logical standpoint, what, what's so wrong about keeping these commandments? Americans today are like subject to four million plus laws. He gives us six hundred something. That's nothing. It's harder to be an American than it is to be a, you know, a Torah observant, Bible believing, you know, Hebrew. So, you know, where's the difficulty? I don't see it. But my life has drastically changed, you know, little and, and you know, in little ways and drastic, drastic ways. It's just a matter of going back and putting the things that count, that, that mean the most, in the, in the order they should be followed. What's your favorite part about your new way of life? Uh, uh, meeting people. I like I like uh, I like the feast, and so the feasts were originally meant to be kept in Jerusalem. Um, it was something. In fact, he gives strict instructions not to do these feasts outside of Jerusalem because I don't want you doing them at home. No, I want you to come in into the city, and I want you to commune with everybody. I want you to gather and worship and fellowship with people. Uh, you know, and so it's this giant corporate worship that takes place for the feast. And right now we're scattered throughout the nations. And so we don't really have the ability to uh, uh, go to Jerusalem right now. It's too expensive. There's all kinds of obstacles. However, I can still do the feast on my own property. We can do them as a memorial, understanding that one day we're going to go back to that land and do them with our Messiah. But the, the camaraderie that takes place, the fellowship, the worship, all these things are deeply mean, meaningful. And so uh, that's what I look forward to. It's something in my, my life now that is truly has hefty meaning for me. If you could reach back to your previous self before you learn this, and you could tell yourself oh. one thing, <laughs> what would you say? Read your Bible. <laughs> Go home, read your Bible. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> what do you see in the next five or ten years with this uh, awakening? Um, okay, or so a few years, it doesn't matter. What I see in the next, what I see in the future of this movement is kind of grim and and that's to say this there are people in Christianity and people in mainstream religious circles who are taking notice of this movement the number one reason they're taking notice of this movement is because the best and the brightest of their congregations are getting up and leaving those who were esteemed to being learned in the word those who who were active in helping the poor the widow and the orphan those because that's the type of people the father is reaching down and remo removing the scales from their eyes I see pastor after pastor proclaiming this movement as a cult because they're losing the best and the brightest of the congregations. And for me, it's, it's only going to get worse. More and more people are going to wake up, as they're doing already. More and more people are going to leave. And right now they're making jokes about this movement. It's going to turn to hatred. And so that's the thing I worry about the most, is, is where the progression is going. And I, I see a, a, a very much a hatred that's building amongst Christianity. That movie Kirk Cameron did this last last time was a result of that. It was all kind of fun and games, jokes, you know, about these people who would poo-poo Christmas. But it's going to turn to anger. It's going to turn to anger because these people are losing the, the, the base, the foundation of Christianity because they're being taken out by the Father. <laughs> Those are all the questions I have written down. Okay. Would you like to add anything else? Is there something I forgot to ask? Yeah, there is something I'd like to add. Okay. The biggest obstacle I see with people who take a look at the Hebrew Roots movement is they point to this person or that person or, or how they argue about this or how they disagree about that or, or maybe this person did something you disagree with, you know, one of the leaders of, in the movement or someone who has some notoriety in the movement. Listen, there's, there's all kinds of disagreements. We all disagree on lots of different things. And it's the same way in Christianity, but don't let that uh, dissuade you from checking it out and looking at what your, actual, your Bible actually says. And so, yeah, there's some disagreements on how we keep the feast. There's some disagreements on how we keep the Shabbat. There's some disagreements on all kinds of things, whether we keep the Shemitah year the Jub of the Jubilee cycle and, and all kinds of things. But, you know, it's okay. We can disagree on things. You know, when our Messiah comes back one day, and He is, even the people in Christianity believe that, and He's coming, and He's coming to regather His people. When, when that happens, He is going to proclaim what is right and what is truth. And all this stuff, all this bickering is not going to matter. So for anyone who would examine this movement and be dissuaded by some of the stuff going on or by, by what someone has said or what someone has done, 
Forget all that. We're just trying to be obedient. We're just trying to do what the Father tells us to do. And we all have different ways of doing it. Um, but we're trying our best. And that's really all that any good parent could ask of their children is for their children to try their best.